Thank you a lot. Um, it's great to be here. Um, it's great to meet the students and the faculty for the program, and um, hopefully it's a fun talk. So this is a standard quote that's gets thrown around a lot. You know, the NFL is a very unpredictable league where, um, you know, a lot of times the better team wins, but generally speaking, lots of crazy stuff happens. I don't know how many people are like avid football fans or minor fans, but even if uh, you're not, um, th this talk is kind of designed to be uh, showing like how you can use machine learning for this particular problem, but it's also designed to show you like how like machine learning you can actually use, right? Most of the time we talk about machine learning, Netflix is giving you recommendations, Google is searching things for you, Amazon wants you to buy things, but you know, it feels very, other people are doing it for you. Like what if you actually have a real life problem yourself, right? For me, my problem was I'm in a fantasy football league with my brother-in-laws and I want to win, right? So, um, and I was, I was doing it without machine learning for years. I was just thinking like, oh, I'll pick this team, I'll pick that team. And every year I was doing it, I'm like, I could probably do better. I should get the computer to make some picks for me. And I waited, waited many years. Um, and then finally I'm like, I'm just going to do it. And so this is sort of like an example for you guys also that you, know, you can actually use this stuff in like real life. Um, so this is joint work uh, with a good friend of mine. We uh, kind of came up with the idea together. We coded it together. Um, you know, he teaches um, at another university in a financial engineering program. Um, also, honorary mention to my 12-year-old daughter. She, um, she also helps with this process. She helps make picks. She insists on taking some cut of the winnings. <laughs> $50 is a lot for like a 12-year-old, so um, she's pretty happy. Um, anyways, um, okay, so how do uh, fantasy football league generally work, right? Um, there's all different varieties of leagues. Um, this one that we're looking at today is like a relatively simple league. You're, we're not picking individual players, um, but just like, let's go back one step. You know, basically as a football fan or a sports fan, you watch every week and you think you like know better. You, the coach should have done this, or that team should have won, or you know, like you think you know better. Um, and then also there's like all the people on TV, they're talking like this should happen or that should happen, this team's gonna win. Like is that all really true? Um, the other thing that, you know, we have like some market information in the sense that, you know, before the games, like there is a betting line, you can go to Las Vegas, you can bet on these games, and you know, you can say this thing called the point spread, which is like the amount that a certain team is supposed to beat another team by, like that probably encapsulates like a lot of information, right? People are, you know, sort of irrational. People always vote for their own team. But you imagine, like, lots of people voting, and they're actually putting their real money at stake. Um, they're not going to, on average, let's make stupid decisions. So one of the ideas for this league is that, you know, we start with the point spreads as, like, a simple way to get started and see if we can really, like, do any better than that using machine learning techniques. Okay, so how does our league work? Our league is, like I said, relatively simple. It's called you know, a pick'em league, meaning that on average every week there's like 16 games. Sometimes there's 14 on bye weeks and stuff like that. But you're supposed to, rather than worry about the point spreads, you're just supposed to pick who wins. So for example, um, you know, whatever. Like I, I forgot all the games this week, but I think Denver was playing like you know, Oakland to, this week, right? And uh, you're, you're supposed to pick outright. You're not supposed to worry about who's favored and who's not favored. You just pick who you think is the winner and then the way you um, kind of like accumulate points in this league is you have to assign points, like 16 all the way down to 1. And if you get your top pick right, then you get 16 points. If you get your second top pick right, you get 15 points. If you miss your 14th pick, you get 0 points for that one. So you can imagine, like, and then the way you win this league is you accumulate points over the course of the year. And the person with the most points at the end of the year wins the, wins the league. And generally speaking, you can win any individual week, right? By be, just going crazy, picking all the right upsets, and getting everything just right. But on average, if you're going to win over the course of the season, it's going to be better to be steady and consistent and just like not make mistakes. Um, so let's just look a little bit of like how this looks when I go to the website. This is how I make my picks. I don't even remember. This was probably like a long time ago. But this is just kind of how it works. So, you know, you pick these two teams. Um, this week, I, you know, the model or I or whoever like decided that Indianapolis was the top pick. And so we assigned like 16 weight to them, 15 weight to them. And then you go and you just enter your picks and it kind of locks it in and then you're competing against everybody else. 
Okay, so what are the various strategies, right? Like, so one thing I kind of already mentioned and alluded to is like, let's pick the simplest strategy that requires like no brain power. Well, I mean, one brain power, no brain power would just be to guess randomly, right? But that's not what we're trying to do. So we take exactly what um, you know Las Vegas is telling us, and we basically take the team that's like the highest spread. So if a certain team is favored to win by 10, and that's the highest that week, we put them at 16. And then the next team, maybe they're only favored to win by seven, so we put them second. And then we go down the line and order them in that um, sort of way. And then we have like some various tiebreakers, like if two teams are both you know, favored to win by four, you know, we just pick the ones that are like a home team. Or like if there's still a tie, then we pick, okay, which one's got the better record. But and on average, like those little differences like don't make much of a difference. On the other hand, you could just do it just ad hoc based, right? You could not care about what Las Vegas says. You could just do your own thing. You could look at the win-loss records of the teams. You could look at, oh, are they playing a good team? Um, are they playing an away game or a home game? Are they playing a division game or a non-division game? Um, so this is a little uh, nuanced, um, depending on how uh, familiar you are with the NFL. Basically, the league is broken up into you know, div like six divisions. Or I think it's like eight divisions nowadays. and um, Basically, you play all the teams in your division multiple times during the season as opposed to not, you don't play everybody. So you have a much more familiar relationship with the teams in your division. You play them much more. There's more heated rivalries. There's more competition. You tend to play a little bit different. Um, and then, you know, other things you could look in. You could look into injury reports. You could just have personal preference and tuition. Um, for example, I know my brother-in-law is a giant Steelers fan. He kind of can't physically bet against them even though they might be like, you know, uh, favorite to lose. Um, so, but, you know, but he'll, fa he'll pick them, but he'll put them at the bottom, like for one point, even if it means that he's picking the wrong thing. But, you know, like I'm not going to do that. I want the machine to tell me what's the right thing to do. Um, but the other thing to remember is like ideally, aside from the personal preference and intuition part, ideally the point spread encapsulates a lot of what's out there in the world. If some major player got injured, the point spreads will affect that. If some team doesn't play good on you know, artificial turf or you know, bad weather, like, it, it should encapsulate that. So our data set is actually relatively clean. So um, if we just look back like, historically at this league, like you know, what happens, um, it turns out that this spread guessing strategy, which you know, I say like, requires no brain power, um, wins. It well, straight up will win this league at half the time. And you know, so I just kind of compiled the years, the winning score of like whoever won that year, and then what this spread method, you know, using some back testing would have would have gotten us. And you can see like, you know, basically four out of the eight years that I looked at it, just using you know no smartness, no machines, uh, no intuition, you would have won this league. So now you're you're already in like you've already set a pretty high bar, right? Because all these people, maybe like 50 people in the league, they're all doing their best to try to win, and you know, this really simple method that requires no guessing is already kind of outperforming them. So how can you do better? So this is where um, I decided to give myself a machine learning project and see if I could do better. Um, so just some basic machine learning basics. We're going to use a, a technique called supervised learning. Supervised learning is where you give the computer some training data. You give it what you call our features, which are like the known uh, you know, variables. And then you actually give it a known result. And then the computer extracts like a model out of that. And then using that model, it can now predict what's going to happen with new examples that it's never seen before. And how good your model is is basically how well did you train the model. Um, OK, so one quick thing. I think we've all seen linear regression before. Um, this is not what we're going to use. Linear regression is good for uh, predicting you know, some y variable when you have a bunch of x variables. And you know, we've all done this before. We've minimized things. Um, but that's not necessarily going to help us with this problem, because we're trying to predict wins and losses. On the other hand, um, a technique called logistic regression is good for classifying things. So this is like you know, some sort of, uh, I think this is from the Coursera machine learning course. Um, but basically, you're trying to discriminate between two people. And you can see. This uh, blue line is what's called the decision boundary. And you have people that are these yellow dots. And you have those black pluses. And the decision boundary more or less does a good job of discriminating between the two. But it doesn't get everything quite right. And maybe that's OK. Because you, know, you can't expect that your machine learning algorithm like, will get it 100% right. And you're willing to live sort of with uh, what Ed mentioned is like 
some googliness, right? Like, it's okay. It doesn't have to be perfect. And in fact, if you had drawn the perfect line that, like, you know, dis discriminates between the, you know, the two different data sets here, you, you get into a problem area that's called overfitting. Like, you fit your data exactly, but you don't actually, you're not very good at making predictions. You're only good at memorizing what happened in the past. So you don't want to get into that problem. So um, when you're doing logistic regression, because you're basically doing like some sort of a binary classification, you want to use a function that like helps you sort stuff out. So you can see this, the standard thing that goes into a log logistic regression is this thing called the sig sigmoid function. It has like a nice feature that it's like smooth, and then if you're above 0.5, um, you know, you very quickly um, goes up to one, and then if you're, sorry, if you're above zero, you very quickly go up to one. If you're below zero, you very quickly go down to zero. And the, basically, the, the answer you get is like related to the probability of the confidence in that pick. So if your probability is closer to 0.99, then you have a very high probability. If your probability is like close to 0.1, then you're closer to zero, so you have a very low probability of, um, well, low probability of being classified as a one, and you have a very high probability of being classified as a zero. And this works for us because in the end, what we're trying to do is we're trying to classify based on our you know, history of these NFL games, like did the team that was favored, did they win the game that they were supposed to win or not? So now um, we're getting a little bit closer to solving our problem. Um, so in the simplest form, like the logistic regression has a set of inputs called features, and it has single output for a binary classifier. And in our case, we have to figure out what are the relevant features that I want to include in the model? And I have to also think about like exactly, like carefully, like what am I going to get the computer to predict? Because I want that probability to be meaningful for when I go to like make my picks, like one through 16. Um, so um, what are the things that we picked? We picked um, a very simple amount of features. We didn't look at a ton of data, we just looked at your current year's and last year's win-loss record. We looked at what week of the season it is, because let's say you have a 100% winning record. That's much different than if you're 1-0 or 10-0. It's much more meaningful. Um, also, we looked to see if it was a home game, because there's a clear advantage to playing at home. And we looked to see if it was a division game, because this is one of the things that I've kind of noticed over the years, that like two teams in general will play each other well. And in these division games, even if you're like an underdog, you tend to play much, much better against your division opponents because of the familiarity, and especially you're at home. And I don't know how many people are like fans, you, all sorts of crazy stuff happens. You know, like the Jets, for example, are not good, but they'll beat New England at home. And you know, nobody's surprised. Um, and then the spread. This is also like one of the key pieces of information that goes into it. And the, the idea here is that we're using the spread and we're using these other features to sort of augment the model to see if we can do better. And then the binary classifier, the final thing we're trying to predict is, did the team that was favored, did they win the game or not? So just zeros and ones. Um, OK, so um, it it's a data science talk. We're going to do some Python. Um, so we use, uh, this Python comes with a really nice uh, machine learning package. Um, I'm sure if you're taking the machine learning course, you run into what's called scikit-learn. Um, it's actually pretty straightforward. Like the actual, um, like Ed said, like 80% of this work was getting the data formatted correctly so that it could actually do three lines of code, right? Literally three lines of code. You have X's, which are your features. You have Y, which is your classifier. And you fit the model, you score the model, and you predict. And that's it. Um, and all the other stuff I'm going to show you is the 80%, which like goes into making sure that like the ones and the zeros and the numbers um, all look good together. All right, so, and then how do we do this? Um, in Python, there's these things called IPython notebooks. Um, you know, normally on a weekly basis, I have like just scripts that run automatically and you know, spit out the right answer. But when I'm doing what's called exploratory data analysis or looking at results and trying to visualize results, um, we try to use these notebooks. So let's see if this doesn't break completely. Um, oh, look at that. Nice use of technology. All right, so here's my notebook. We'll go through it relatively quickly. Um, there's, you know, first of all, there's just some like setups. You import some directories, you import some packages, turn off warnings. 
Um, let's see here. So I'm not going to run it live because I'm sure if I tried to do that, it would break. But I did run it just not too long ago, so you should believe me. It's not completely uh, canned. Um, OK, so first of all, we have some reference data. Here's the teams, what league they're in, what division they're in. This is important, aside from the historical data. Um, the next thing is we're going to do is we're going to define what we call the test and training sets. So anytime you're doing machine learning, uh, you want to, you're trying to make predictions, and you're trying to see how good your predictions are. So you don't want to uh, validate your data based on stuff that you memorize. So you want to hold out some data that you haven't seen before. And then you want to see how good your model uh, works on that. Luckily for us, because we have like a lot of historical data, I can basically run the model on, let's say, and I, what we chose to do is like pick three years of data. So let's say we took the data from 2008, 9, and 10, and then we predict what we think would have happened in 2011. And since 2011 has passed already, we can test to see if our model was any good or not. And so this is how we tested the model. But this is actually live. We're I'm going to show you like what we do on a weekly basis to make the predictions for this week. So right now, the test year is 2016. We don't know what's going to happen. We want to predict for 2016. And we're going to train based on these three years, 2013 through 15. And we kind of mess with different um, ideas of uh, which, how many years to use. Like five years seems like a good idea, but it ended up being too, uh, you know, it like incorporated information that was a little too old. One season was like not enough information to get the statistics like kind of robust. Um, and then the other thing I would like to remind you is that this is mostly like a fun project. And you know, you guys can ask like a ton of questions, like did I do this and did I do that? And we thought about some things and we didn't think about others. But I think this idea is that you know you can you know use this as a starting point in your explorations using machine learning and see how far you want to go. But I'm happy for suggestions though because I do want the model to get better. <laughs> OK, so um, this is the part that is, this is like the 80%, basically getting all the training data. You read in all the games. You like look at the records of the teams. You have to compute all these like metrics for you know, who's in what division, um, who won, who lost. Um, and then so I do it for the training set. I do it for the test set. Not that exciting. Um, OK, so right before I'm about to send in the data to the model, like what does it look like? So I, the computer doesn't care whether Baltimore is playing Pittsburgh. It's just, just, just a name to it, right? So the things that the computer cares about is the features that I talked about. So this is what the features look like. The favored record. This is the first week of the season. So clearly your, fa your current record for everybody is 0%. And, then, and this is why the previous year's record is somewhat important, because the first game of the season, who knows who's going to win? There's just the spread, right? But hopefully, if like the Super Bowl winner is playing, you know, somebody who was like terrible last year, that's some indication of, uh, you know, who might be better. So we have the previous record. We have which game of the week you're at. We have the line. We um, take the absolute value of it because we have another uh, field here that says favored home game. So that automatically accounts for the minus sign or the plus sign as to who might be favored. And there's this flag for a division game. And then th this is the classifier. It's not that exciting. It's just zeros and ones. In that week, did the favored team win? So I send this all to the scikit classifier. And um, it's pretty straightforward. Um, this is all wrapped so that we can uh, you know, run this over and over again. But what I showed you before about running the classifier and predicting it, it, inside, it really is like just those three lines. So we set up the classifier. And then we can predict uh, week nine, which is the week that just happened. So we're going to look to see what happens. And then we kind of look at like, what does the prediction data look like? Um, and so basically what's happening is you know, these were the games this last week. And I rank them by the probability that the particular team would win. And so the nice thing here is like, not only does it tell me that if I'm above 50%, that's telling me that the favored team should win. And there's only one upset pick this week. Turned out it didn't work. but. Um, <laughs> Everything that's above 50% should be that the favored team wins. And this also gives me a way to rank the teams between 16 all the way down to 1. There's also only 14 games this week, so it goes 16 down to 3. And so this is what I need to do in order to uh, make my picks into the system. Um, and then you can just see, like, uh, and that's pretty much it. Like, we can see what the model would have predicted. Um, and so let's just jump back to uh, basically the the other thing here we'll uh, present, and then we'll show a little bit of results now that we show how we use this. OK, so back testing. 
So we trained over multiple sets of three-year periods and like looking forward like another year. And we looked to see how the spread strategy would have done against the person who won the league that year. And we also extrapolated how like the machine learning strategy would have done that year. And it looks pretty good. Um, and this is back testing. So we just have to remember that like back testing is like never as good as forward testing. Um, I don't know if anyone's ever traded on Wall Street at a hedge fund. You have all these great ideas. You're going to make money. You try to put it in action in real life. It doesn't work. Um, but, you know, but still, you have to do your back testing, and you have to convince yourself that um, you went through some like, reasonable amount of uh, you know, effort to make sure that you think the strategy is going to work going forward. And then you tweak it along the way as things break or you come up with more information. Um, one thing that I'll mention is like, I keep referring to this moderate strategy over here. There's a bunch of like, different ways that you could actually make the picks in this particular league. Um, one particular way, which I call the conservative strategy, is to just always pick the favorite, regardless, but then only like, use the numbers to kind of reshuffle the order. So that would be very similar to the spread strategy. It would just kind of change the order of some of them. Um, the other thing is to actually pick the predicted team. So for example, I don't know if you remember, at the bottom it said Baltimore um, was, well, Pittsburgh had a 44% chance of winning, which means Baltimore, the underdog, should be favored to win. So we're going to actually pick Baltimore to be favored to win, but we're going to put them at the bottom of the pile, just because it, it's an upset. Well, the other thing we could do, which I call the aggressive strategy, is to figure out what's the relation to the 0.5. Because like, what if Baltimore, what if the probability of Pittsburgh winning was zero? Right? That means it's a 100% chance that Baltimore is going to win. So then I should actually take Baltimore and put it way at the top at 16. But you know, we did some back testing on that, and it turned out that the aggressive strategy tends to have like a very high standard deviation. It like wins some years like by 140 points, and it loses other years by 140 points. And so, you know, in an effort to be you know a little bit more conservative and to see if we could like win more consistently, we decided to pick this moderately conservative strategy. And and then live testing, right? Live testing, like how how does it work? Any good or, at all or not? So 2014 was the first year that we ran this strategy. The spread strategy actually won that year. Um, my daughter was happy because she's the one who puts in the picks for the spread strategy because she's pretty sure that that's the best one. <laughs> um, the moderate strategy did not do so well this year, that year. Um, last year was pretty ideal. Um, the moderate strategy came in first place and the spread strategy came in third place. And um, the second person was just barely above the spread strategy. So um, that was actually kind of nice. And it was like a little bit of validation of the model and how it works. And um, we were happy to see that happen. And, um, and then currently, um, we're not doing so hot. <laughs> but I will say that because it's like a slow and steady strategy, like about two thirds of the way through the season is like when it really kind of like starts to build up and like the, the consistency of it starts to like outperform the people that are just like making random guesses on a weekly basis. So hopefully good things will happen. And, um, and then just, you know, depending on how much football you watch on su Sundays and Monday nights, um, this is what we had picked for this current week. And you can see that um, the spread strategy, which is the far corner, if you see favored win, they only got two wrong, whereas the algorithm with the moderate strategy actually got three wrong because it wrongly picked the upset of Baltimore over Pittsburgh, and picked, Pittsburgh actually won. So, um, and then the Seattle game, which is why I'm wearing a Seattle t-shirt, is going to happen tonight. <laughs> and they're predicted to win. <laughs> I'm not necessarily a fan, but um, it's, it's, it's fun to root for the algorithm. <laughs> 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 and that's all. I um, hopefully we have a little bit of time for questions. Thanks very much. We've got a hand right up there at the back straight away. If anyone's got a, a mic, we'll go to the back. Thank you. Thank you. Is the time OK? Yeah, we've got 10 minutes for oh, questions. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Hi. Uh, thanks so much for your presentation. Sure. Uh, one immediate question I have is um, football, to me, doesn't seem, I'm a sports fan. I like a lot of different sports. And if I were going to do something like this, football would not be first on my list because of the, no, the very limited number of games. Um, right. That's like seems like well, at least one thing that would make this a little less conducive right. 
your training tet sets and dev sets and all that just can't be as large, you know, baseball, 162 yeah, yeah, games, yeah. all that stuff. So, so did that go into you? I mean, are you just a huge football fan? Like, what, what are the contributors to No, you no, I'm football? like a big sports fan all around. And the idea is to sort of, like, use this as, like, a starting point. Um, and then we definitely want to look into, like, baseball and um, even, like, I don't know, pro cycling. You know, that's, like, one of the, my favorite things. Oh, okay. <laughs> you know, it doesn't seem like a team sport, but it is. It is if, um, so, yeah, I agree. Like, with baseball, there's definitely a lot more, like, 162 games over the course of the season, uh, lots of individual player statistics. And then the other thing, you know, this was just literally to get started to win this particular league. Um, but even like you can imagine starting to look at player statistics and how, to, how do you do like a player team oriented fantasy league. But yeah, it's uh, certainly a good point. Not limited to football at all. Thanks. Okay. Okay, we've got, uh, let's go right across to the end of, uh, are we just on, are we down at one mic at the moment? Yeah, just at the moment, yeah. Okay. Uh, gentleman in the white shirt there, and then, we'll, and then you can pass it back for the next question after that. Thank you. Hello, thank you for the presentation. Sure. Um, is this thing on? Uh, we can hear you. Yeah, it's good. Okay. <laughs> yes, yeah, so my question is that it sounds like your model relies a lot on the, um, the Vegas spread. Mm -hmm. I was thinking, um, well, why do you use the Vegas spread? And uh, have you thought about replacing it, say, with, I don't know, the predictions from 538, for instance, instead oh, right. of the Vegas spread? Um, yeah, so that's a good point. Um, so for, I think the thing is, like, what 538 does is they do some version of this, right? They do something else that is also, like, model-driven, right? So I think one of the lessons that I got from the years of working at Wall Street is there's like market information, right? So 538 is model information, and then there's market information. And there's a difference between what the bank says is the valuation of a security according to the model and what the market says. And companies have gone bankrupt and credit crises have happened. Um, so the idea was to take market information. And I think what we do is we look at 538 to see what they're predicting. Um, I think even like Bing, like Microsoft search engine, if you just type in like NFL games, like they give like a probability of winning and we've kind of like matched up ours, you know, to see like, oh, like, are we totally off base? What are they doing? We're trying to, we have, n we don't really know like what they're doing, but it must be something along these lines. Um, but, you know, probably they're using like a much larger, richer data set to kind of, you know, pull in. This is meant to be like relatively simple, like literally like five inputs into the model and see if we could like, you know, do something that's uh, interesting and effective. But yeah, great question. Thanks. Hi. Um, my question is, can you talk a little bit about why you picked uh, logistic regression versus any other uh, uh, classifier? Right. Um, yeah, so one of the reasons I picked, uh, so the thing is, um, one of the things I didn't show here is that we do like run a third strategy. Um, and they're using like support vector machines. And that one also is like a really high volatility. Um, and so we haven't gotten that to work. So there is like certain amount of like, um, uh, what's the word, like machine learning know-how and like really understanding like some of those like algorithms, like much more like theoretical basis. Logistic regression, I feel like is the simplest to understand because of the binary classifier and because we're doing a binary output. Um, for example, the support vector machines, when it gives a probability, it's not uh, easily visualizable in this like sigmoid function oriented way. So I think for the illustrative purposes, like logistic regression is also like a great idea, but we are trying to test like other, you know, decision trees and random forests and see if like something would do better or not. But that being said, like so far over the years, the logistic regression has actually performed the best um, in terms of like going up against live competition. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, we've got a uh, uh, hand right at the back there in the corner. Yes, Mike's coming to you, thanks. Sorry, since it's a dialogue, I feel ob ob obligated to talk for a minute and yeah, not sure. ask you a question. Is that yeah. fair? Yeah, <laughs> Kind of trying to talk about what Ed talked and you talked together with the question of like, why start at a domain that doesn't have that much data, mm -hmm. not sports, but right. this particular sport. I'd like to actually tell you that I think uh, statistics and machine learning started with small data, not big data. And I know it's a very good 
thing to always think about big data as the challenge, like processing the data and doing all that. It's much more intensive when you have big data, but the challenge with small data is actually a very important one. I know sports may not be like life-threatening <laughs> moments, and we may not think about it as important as, as I personally don't think about it as important as other things in life, mm -hmm. but, um, but I think that uh, this raises actually a really good point in data. More data is better than no data, and it's a really big, important topic. There's a lot of domains that don't have big data and are very, very important to tackle, and the algorithms, not all of them, but a lot of them, especially like the stuff that you were talking about, are applicable, and we should not shy away from them just because they're small, smaller data sets. So I really do, I'm going to talk a little bit about agriculture where life isn't as pretty with big data sometimes. And so I'm really a big advocate of taking something with small data and show, showcasing it, trying it, and even failing and learning from it. So uh, I appreciate the, the effort to go not into baseball, which I personally <laughs> dislike. So thank you for trying to tackle something different. All right. I've got a mic, so I'm going to talk. Uh, so going on, going on the same line of thinking, uh, do you think adding features to those additional five, those initial five, adding additional features would right. improve the quality of your predictions given your experience, or do you feel like the simplest method is the best given the success of the spread relatively? Um, so I think definitely like more data would um, kind of enhance the model, but the nice thing about machine learning models is like you don't presuppose like, so I put in this thing, like, for the division games that I think is important, right? But the, the, when you actually run the model, it kind of spits back out at you, like, what is the relative weight of that factor? And if it thought it was useless, it would be zero. Or, you know, you can, another thing you can do with what's called feature engineering and machine learning is, like, you can take out that feature and seeing if your training accuracy goes up or these results are more stable. So we kind of did that with at least the features that we picked. Um, and then, but we are trying to figure out like how to add more data, um, but it is also an 80% problem, right? Like, you know, it, it's just like work and, uh, <laughs> and we just haven't gotten there. But uh, I think definitely like there's lots of other data in the world where you can look at like defensive statistics and offensive statistics. Um, you know, do you care about like individual like player in injuries and stuff like that? Like if a star quarterback is like not playing, like is the difference that, I guess the thing is like what this, the whole point of this exercise is that the spread is already telling you something and can the model uncover like, does a home game mean more than what the spread is already telling you, right? Because generally speaking, you kind of hear anecdotally that like all things being equal, the home team has like a three point advantage in the spread, right? So it's already baked in. So it's only the efficient market hypothesis these, or something. What's that? Like the efficient market hypothesis. Right, right, like exactly. That. So it's only like, can the model discover something that it's not taking into account as much as it should, or overdoing something? And so, yeah, that's like an open question. Like, who knows which things will be relevant or not? But it's definitely worth trying with other data sets. Volunteers okay. are welcome. Okay, we've time for a couple more questions. Um, let's take, yeah, the mic is getting passed to you there, and then we'll go to the back for the final question. Thank you. Um, so has anyone in your league become more data-driven as a result of you doing this project? Um, I'm not sure. Um, they all know I'm doing it. <laughs> um, I even tell them that the person who, like, wins the league just straight up uses spreads. But I think the thing is everybody, like, it's a fun thing too, right? So... Um, there is like some, I think what happens with a lot of people is they start with the spreads and then they make tweaks. Like they just kind of adjust based on personal preference and intuition and what they happen to know. So I think maybe some people are doing that a little bit more, but um, it still seems to be just kind of like a fun thing. Let me see if I can outwit the algorithm. And not to say the algorithm's not amazing all the time. It does pick bizarre things. And you know, even I like question it and I'm like, uh, who knows, but, you know, <laughs> we just go with it and we root for the algorithm. <laughs> yeah, great. Question at the back there. Yep. All right. <laughs> so um, when you were talking about the, the spread, because there's a lot of interesting information baked into it, right. have you ever actually thought of trying to predict the spread and see what kind of inputs actually go into the spread itself? and try to understand that a little bit more deeply. Mm. So we haven't tried to predict the spread, but one thought that we had was to take out the spread 
and see if like it could like rank you know independent of the spread yeah. right so that would be like an interesting thing because then you're almost like recreating the spread or doing like an agnostic thing where you're not taking this like market information. Mm -hmm. um, so that's like one thing we've thought of. We haven't tried to predict the spread, but that's an interesting, uh, it'd be, a, I guess what you'd have to do is you'd have to take these probabilities and like map them historically to what that means, right? Like is a 90% probability a 10 point spread or not? You know, then you would do some linear regression probably. Yeah. Seems like it'd be fun. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and the other thing I was thinking of, uh, have you thought of incorporating, because um, we have these beautiful simulators that we've been building for 12 years now. Yep. Is it Madden 2016 and actually running a whole bunch of games on that? Oh. Okay. And then adding that as another feature. No, I have not thought about that. That's kind of cool. Damn. <laughs> the one thing I have thought of, though, um, so this is like, obviously, like, writing a bunch of Python code, using scikit-learn, et cetera, et cetera, there are starting to be like drag and drop machine learning tools for the non-programmer. I think like Microsoft has something. Um, there's something called Big ML. There's this new thing I just ran across the other day called Orange. I forgot what it was called, Orange something or other. But basically they're tools for the data savvy person, but not necessarily like a Python programmer to like pull in your data you know, say that these things are, you know, kind of do a little bit of cleansing, do a little bit of that 80%, and, you know, say that these are the features, this is the variable, and predict for me. And I actually tried running this on big ML, and it more or less gives, like, the same answer that the, um, you know, the model was giving, sh short of, like, not knowing what the tiebreakers were. Mm. So that, that was kind of cool, I thought, that it was, like, like, this is almost achievable for the masses or my brother-in-law if he wanted to, you know? <laughs> Great. Amit, thanks so much for uh, sure. sharing your uh, fantasy football work with us.